So I've indicated on the board there why instances or tautologies are universally valid. So again, just let's look a little bit more at um, what we're talking about. <clears throat> So something like this, 4v1 phi errors, it's not the case that 4v2 psi. This is something that can't be, I'll just change cameras to show you. This is something that can't be a tautology, instance of a tautology. All I could think of this is looking like something like this, P1 arrows P2. So I can say this is an instance of this, where I put this subformula for P1 and this one for P2. But this of course isn't a tautology, right? It may be that this is true and this is false, in which case the whole thing is false. So this is not an instance. Of a tautology. So, but nor can any atomic formula. So let's say R of T1, T2, right? Or S equals T. These are also not instances of tautologies. I mean, at most I could think of this as just being some P1 by itself, or well, this is some P1 by itself. So I could, but I could substitute R for P1 or this equation for P1 here, but this isn't a tautology because it can be false sometimes. But on the other hand, you might have something like you know, 4v0 phi here and for all v3 chi, for all v0 phi, or for all v3 chi here. Now this, as it turns out, happens to be an instance of a tautology. I can think here I've got the same formula. I've got p and p here. And here I've got instances of p2 say P2, P2. So how the shape of this looks like this. And this you can check by truth tables is a tautology. So this is universally valid. So this is universally valid here. So the take home message from this is lemma 352, right, which is page 58. Every instance of a tautology is universally valid. And I've tried to indicate there on the board why that's the case. And there's a proof given there, but I'm going to skip it. Let's now just look at the uh, recap repetition of a definition from earlier from 1.2. I've got first order languages L and L prime. And this perhaps has got more relations or functions or constant symbols than this one here. So the relation symbols of the R here. So this is supposed to be a script R here. There are perhaps function symbols and constant symbols. So this language is possibly larger than this 
this language here. So if I've got, if this here is an L prime structure, the reduct of M to L, so we'll write that as M, as it were, cut down to L here, is the structure M, we keep the same domain, but we just throw away the functions, relations, and constants that are named in L prime, but not in L. So it's a fancy word for something which we'll see is quite, quite simple. By discarding the relations functions and constants, in the, in the construct, in the structure M, which are not named by symbols in L. Prime, in L. So example, 355. I could take the structure here, the natural number structure. Here are the natural numbers. I've got plus and times, and I've got the successor, and I've got zero. So I've got three function symbols, one constant symbol. <clears throat> so I could say n minus, I throw away some of the things in here. Maybe I just take plus and successor. This is a reduct of this. So I have the same domain. I've just thrown away some of the some of the things in the structure. So that's all. And the lemma 356 makes a point. Again, it's one of these kinds of lemmas that just say, you know, what is not being talked about is irrelevant for being true truth in a structure. So in just the situation we're talking about, one language extending another, I've got a structure for the larger language here. And I've got T a term of, of L, not L prime, L here. And I've got an assignment function. Then the assignment function, when I do the assignment here in the language L prime, actually, it makes no difference if I think of this here. So this is the, the valuation of the term in the structure M. Now M has some extra things inside it, right? Compared to the reduct of M restricted to L. Right? But the T doesn't mention any of these things, right? T is a term of L, not L prime, right? So it's not gonna make any difference, right? How we interpret 
this T, whether we think of eventually we're going to interpret in M or in the, re the reduct, M restricted to L. <clears throat> so again, to go, to go back to the example here, 355. <clears throat> I could have a term here. Let's see, let's call this, <clears throat> you know, zero plus V zero. Right. Here's my term T. Now T is a term in the language appropriate for N minus right, here. Yeah, after all, it only mentions plus. So now if I've got any particular assignment, if I look at the interpretation of here of this term T here, it's going to be, well, whatever the assignment function W assigns to V0, 126, say, maybe W0 is 126. So this is going to work out as 0 plus 126. Right? And the point is the term doesn't mention times or successor, right? Uh, so I've talked about zero here, so let me put zero back to this one. Because I'm talking about zero in my term. So zero is in both places and plus is in both places. So the interpretation of the term doesn't depend upon times and successor. And that's all the lemma says. Right? Yes, so the interpretations will be the same. Right? Similarly, phi is a formula. Now again, of L, not L prime. Then an assignment here will make this come out true in M if and only if it does in the reduced structure. Because there's nothing in phi that mentions any of the vocabulary or any of the apparatus that's in L prime but not in L. So the extra pieces of the structure here don't matter. So now what we're going to do is <clears throat> look back at um, the definition for of a formal deductive system that was there given in the first part of the course in section 3.2. What we've done so far right, is we've looked at kind of general structures and possibility of expressing in a language propositions about those structures. We've given a rigorous definition of what a formal language is, <clears throat> and also what it means for a formula to be satisfied in that structure. We've given a kind of mathematical definition of what it is, the satisfaction relation between structures and formulae under assignments into that structure. So this is kind of concentrated on this kind of semantics or meaning how we interpret a formula and give it meaning when applying it to a structure. So now what we're going to do is look at um, ideas of proof. Right? So we're going to think about looking at formulae and seeing which ones that are provable within a system or which ones are provable from certain axioms. And we're going to look at the mathematics of deductive systems themselves. So, <clears throat> We're going to establish theorems about a, d a deductive system with the so-called Hilbert style calculus. Now, the Hilbert style calculus itself is rather simple to describe, and it's actually rather unwieldy for doing proofs. Nobody would actually adopt rigorously the idea of mathematical proof as being something you could prove in a Hilbert style system. It's uh, it, you know, even proving the simplest of formulae is kind of way, way too complicated. On the other hand, it does encompass all other kinds of deductive systems. 
Because it's simple, it means that the arguments that we can, the inductive arguments we apply to it, are also <coughs> relatively straightforward. Um, so what we're going to do is then see how, from a notion of proof, we can see if something is provable from, from a set of axioms gamma, we'll, we'll be able to show that any structure in which the axioms gamma holds, then that provable statement must be hold, must, must hold too. That's sort of known as soundness. So it's saying that the rules of proof will preserve truth. So in particular, if you've got a formula that's provable in the system <clears throat> without any axioms or hypotheses, without any hypotheses, so it's provable just from the empty set of hypotheses, then it'll turn out to be universally valid. So recall, we're trying to kind of characterize universal validity. We're trying to chase after the notion of universal validity. So we've got an inclusion in one direction. This is the so-called soundness theorem, which is the first thing we'll come to, first theorem we'll come to. It'll say that anything that's provable in the system from zero hypotheses is universally valid. We'll see that the axioms themselves are universally valid. So the rules of proof that we'll use preserve universal validity, which is good. We don't want our rules of proof suddenly to work on something that's true in all structures and then produce something that isn't. And remarkably, what Gödel showed was the so-called completeness or adequacy theorem. Gödel showed that, in fact, if something was um, universally valid, then it was provable, which is an entirely different kettle of fish. Right? OK, so what we'll do first is go back and review the logical axioms and rules of proof for a Hilbert-style deductive system. So this is. Uh, in section 3.2 of Charles Morgan's notes and page 44. <clears throat> so what we have here is predicate calculus, BC, for first order language. And it consists of a set of axioms and a set of rules of inference. And the logical axioms, they form two groups. So the first three are actually all instances of tautologies that we were talking about. I could think of A1 here as being an instance of P implies Q implies R. P implies Q implies P. So A1 here is, this here is a tautology. If you draw the truth table out for this guy, you'll get all T's there in the final column. And likewise for two, this is also an instance of a, of a tautology. Just put PQ and R for phi, psi and chi in there and draw a truth table for it. And likewise three is a tautology as well. So those axioms don't say anything about quantifiers. Right? The next group are four, five, six are about a more peculiar to first order languages. Right? So you can see here, what I've got is a quantified formula phi for all vi phi. This arrows implies phi where I substitute now t for vi. I make sure I only use legitimate T's in the substitution. Five is saying, if I quantify over an implication, right? if the quantified variable isn't one of the free variables of phi, right? then I can say this here is a conclusion, that phi arrows for all vi psi. It's a sort of distributive law of a strange kind, when vi is not a free variable of phi. 
Uh, the last two relate to equality. So the first here is the equation that everything equals itself. And A7 is, again, a axiom that says that things are sensible. If I've got two terms which are equal, then if I substitute T in for a variable in a couple of places, T0, this is the same as putting in T1. I put in a couple of places here just to make this contrast that it looks slightly funny. Why didn't he put in T1 here as well? Right? I mean, actually, it's it's kind of deliberate. Right? If you have the axiom like this, it's just easier to deduce things from it. We won't be doing much in the way of deductions from it, so this won't really appear too much. But this isn't a misprint; it's intentional. Right? So again, we only put in terms that are substitutable right, in the relevant places. Right? So basically, this is saying, you know, if I substitute in T0 or T1, right, because they are deemed to be equal, I'm not going to have any difference. The rules of inference down here at the bottom. So R1 is sometimes called modus ponens. And basically it says if you've got P and you've got P arrows Q, then you can deduce Q. So this is what we have here. If I've got P and I've got P arrows Q, I can deduce Q. We say it's an immediate consequence of these two things. So this is unproblematic. Unpro the generalization rule says, you know, imagine you've got a formula phi and it says something about BK. Well, actually, if you deduce this formula phi <clears throat> and you've got this variable there, that means a variable could be anything. So we then allow ourselves to deduce for all VK phi as an immediate consequence of phi. So there are two rules and seven groups of axioms. Right? Now, these can be any formula at all. So actually, there's an infinite number of axioms here. If we assume our language has got countably many formulae in it, which we do for the most part, right? then there are countably many formulae in each of these axiom groups here. Oh, except A6. Well, there's infinitely many of those because we assume we've got infinitely many variables. So it's an infinite set of axioms here. Three fifteen on the next page right, says what a proof is going to be. So let me just draw something. Right? So there's a single turn style here, right? And the idea is that phi is provable in PC, I'll say predicate calculus, from gamma. And we'll say this holds if, just like any mathematical proof, I've got a finite list of lines of the proof that'll end with phi. And during the proof, I can use any of the axioms, which we've just talked about on the previous page, or hypotheses from gamma. So gamma is a set of formulae. It might be empty. In which case, if it's empty, we write this. So empty set phi is written this here. Yeah. 
So if so, then a proof will be then, as I said, a finite number of lines like this. The thing at the bottom, a theorem, if you like, what's being proven is phi. And what can occur here are axioms or hypotheses from gamma. And then any line on the proof must come from previous lines by either R1 or R2. So this must be the result of applying a rule R1 or R2 to previous lines higher up the list. So there might be a line here and who knows what it is, right? It could be that there was some formula up here, psi, and we apply the rule R2 to this psi to get this one, say for the I psi. Applying R2 to the earlier line up here. Or it might be the result of applying modus ponens to two earlier lines. It might be up here, I've got something that's like psi as chi, and then maybe here I've got a chi, a psi occurring. So then I'm allowed in my proof to write down at a later point chi. Right? I regard chi as being proven from the two things above, applying rule R1. And that essentially is the definition here. We define what a proof or a deduction or derivation of phi from gamma is. It's a sequence of formulae, a list of formulae. Last thing on the list is phi. And for anything that occurs on the list, it's either an axiom, it come, or it comes from gamma, or it comes from two earlier lines by applying R, R1, or it comes from a single earlier line by applying R2. There was one caveat, right? that if we apply R2 to go from phi i to for all vk phi j, then vk can't be any of the free variables of the formulae that are in gamma. It'll mess things up, if so. So if there is a proof of phi from gamma, we write this. Here is gamma being empty, then I write phi by itself. We just say phi is outright a theorem, PC. So theorem, sorry, remark here is just the obvious one. If I can prove phi from hypotheses gamma, I can prove it from any larger set because sigma contains everything I needed for that proof. That's kind of trivial. And the next remark explains why we have this, this caveat over here. So think about meaning, semantic considerations. Our aim is that if something is provable from gamma, then for any structure in which gamma is true, phi is true. Okay, so let's suppose L is just got this constant symbol. And here I've got a very simple structure. It's just the natural numbers with this one constant here, zero. So we've interpreted C as zero. So perhaps I should have a superscript there for the zero. Okay, so now take gamma to be 
have just one, one formula in it. It's the atomic equation, VI equals C. Now, suppose that the restriction here of R2 was not in place. Right? Then from gamma, I can prove this formula. It's the only thing that's there in gamma. That, I can write that down on my list. Now, if I could use generalization over apply R2 to this variable VI, I would then have this here, provable from gamma. Okay. But this will be clearly nonsense. This says everything equals C, but this isn't true in M, obviously. So if we're wanting to keep this kind of relationship going, we can't allow unbridled universal quantification over the free variables of gamma. So this example shows why we do this here. The last remark here is, again, just sort of pointing out the obvious, the proof was a finite number of lines. So actually, if I do a proof of phi using this hypothesis set gamma, I only use a finite amount of gamma in that proof. So this was kind of super, most of gamma was superfluous if it was infinite. It was just a finite subset of gamma from which I need, which I need to prove phi. So actually I only need <clears throat> the VK free variables to not be appearing in gamma zero, the things that I actually need, which is somewhat, slightly somewhat to the side. Okay, so next time we will look at a few more examples of how proofs run. And we'll see the proofs are actually quite awkward. But we'll then see a number of methods as to how you can kind of speed up proofs. But that will be next time. So until then.